Good evening and welcome to the Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dr Lucy Ingram. Tonight's second case is a presentation of infertility um, uh, presenting in rural general practice. Discussing the case tonight, we have an expert panel consisting of uh, Dr Ros Dunlop, a uh, rural GP and medical educator with QRME in Toowoomba, Queensland. We have uh, Dr John Isler, a specialist obstetrician and gynaecologist from Queensland Fertility Group in Toowoomba. And also uh, Miss Lita Feen, uh, senior nurse coordinator um, at Queensland Fertility Group, also here in Toowoomba. Can we please welcome our specialist and expert panellists? As usual, we are being live streamed around Australia. We have a number of participants watching remotely, so I encourage you all to join the discussion by emailing your question to grandrounds at qrme.org.au or you can tweet your question using the hashtag now on your screen. Our presenter tonight is Dr Aravu Weslin from the Lockyer Doctors in Gatton and Laidley. Uh, she will be presenting an interesting case on um, a female uh, cause of infertility presenting in rural general practice. Please put your hands together for Aravu. Good evening again to everybody um, and welcome to the second session of the Rural Grand Rounds on um, Women's Health. I just want to apologise in advance. I don't have the best of voices tonight, and if I do land up coughing, do bear with me. So, um, as Lucy said, I'm Ari Westland, one of the doctors uh, working in uh, Laidley. I'm in my second year GP training. Um, tonight, I wanted to be presenting a case of infertility, and I've chosen polycystic ovarian syndrome as our case for tonight. Um, quite different to Nazik's presentation, I just wanted to give a bit of a rundown on, on about the condition before I actually go on to the case. So what is infertility? Infertility is defined as the failure to conceive following 12 months of unprotected intercourse. And sometimes in women over the age of 35, it can be defined as a six month period of um, failing to conceive. Um, there's some statistics from the World Health Organization which came through in um, 2012 which looked at the last 20 years and they found that it affects as much as 8 to 12 percent of couples globally. That's a staggering 80 million people in the world. And here in Australia, it seems to affect at least one in six couples. Um, as we know, um, the types of infertility and um, it could be due to the male factor, the female factor, some other causes and some are unknown as well. Coming to the female infertility itself, it's, it can be up to 40% of the reason for infertility. And um, one of the common causes is polycystic ovarian syndrome, so I thought I'll talk about it a little more. Um, it is the most common endocrine abnormality in women of the reproductive age group. It was first described in 1935 as Steen and Leventhal. In Australia, the first uh, population-based prevalence study uh, was done in 2010 in um, Robinson Institute in Adelaide and they found that it was as high as 12 to 18 percent of women and it seemed to be especially high in overweight and indigenous women. It was also interesting that they found that as high a number as 50 to 70 percent may even be going undiagnosed. So the most commonly, how do we diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome? The most commonly accepted consensus for, is, for it is the Rotterdam criteria, which requires at least two out of three. The first being uh, oligo or onorrhea or annulation. So cycles that are longer than 35 days, it could be less than eight cycles or eight periods in a year, or it can even be completely absent periods. It could be a range from completely absent to less than eight periods a year. The second one is either clinical or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism, which could be acne, hirsutism, male type of alopecia, acanthosis nigricans, or increased androgen levels on blood tests. The third one, polycystic ovaries, and they've described it as 12 or more peripheral antral follicles, uh, or an increased ovarian volume. And this is seen not in all patients, but up to 86% of patients with um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I've just put a little uh, picture for an idea. The, well, the picture on the left is a normal ovary, and the one on the right is a polycystic ovary, which led to the, the famous string of pearls or the necklace appearance, which is the peripheral antral follicles. 
If I were to talk about pathophysiology, I could probably talk all night, or at least the next few hours, and I don't want to do that. So I just wanted to highlight a few things before we move on to the case. So we should be aware that the endocrine abnormality actually begins soon after puberty. And the two main things that seem to be common are the, um, for causation are the, the chronic uh, luteinizing hormone elevation and insulin resistance. So it's been found that everything in the syndrome can't be just explained with this, but it does play a huge role in the syndrome. And they are responsible for causing the ovarian growth, the androgen production, and ovarian cyst formation. We know that PCOS can be familial, but the genetic cause for the high LH has yet to be found out. Obesity is also seen as an association in up to 65% of patients with uh, polycystic ovaries. And this increases their insulin resistance, which therefore leads to hyperinsulinemia. And the hyperinsulinemia is responsible for producing hyperandrogenism by two mechanisms. One, directly increasing the ovarian production of androgens, and two, decreasing the production of hepatic production of sex hormone binding globulin, which thereby allows more free antigen in the bloodstream. Just wanted you to concentrate on the, um, the hormone graph out there in the um, first graph, which is the normal menstrual cycle. As you can see, the LH, which is in uh, pink, and the FSH, which is in blue, um, you can see that they are about the same, or the LH is even a little lower than the <clears throat> uh, FSH. And then with the rising estradiol levels, there is that LH surge, which is responsible for ovulation. However, in the PC, the a woman with PC polycystic ovarian syndrome, you see there's a chronic elevation of that LH, and there's peak, the, the, the you know, mid-cycle peak, which we see in normal women is absent, and thereby no ovulation. And you see the typical arrest of the follicles in the prenatal stage. Now, there could be various presentations of uh, polycystic ovarian in a general practice setting. You know, younger adolescent and early 20s probably should be presenting with probably more of hyperandrogenic symptoms and maybe in menstrual irregularities. Women in their 20s and 30s seem to be presenting more with menstrual irregularities and infertility. And as we go into the older age group, older than 35, we're sort of starting to see more signs of insulin resistance. It could be impaired glucose tolerance or uh, type 2 diabetes. All these, whichever group they are, they seem to have a predisposition for obesity and thereby uh, adverse uh, cardiovascular risk profiles. When we look at them at the physical features, we should be thinking about the mental health issues as well. And it was, I was surprised to find that the depression is about 64%, as high as 64% sometimes in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, anxiety in 34 to 57%, and a few other disorders as eating disorders, negative body image, psychosexual dysfunction, etc. So how do we work up a woman who presents to us? Of course, the um, workup is going to depend on what she's going to be presented with, and that can be a little varied. Uh, the, an uh, important thing is a thorough menstrual history right from the menarche and onset of menstrual irregularities. An obstetric history is, of course, important as whether she's uh, uh, ever conceived, whether there's been history of miscarriages, because that seems to be common in um, polycystic ovarian syndrome as well. A complete past uh, medical and surgical history is important. Medication history should not be left out because transient thyroidism can be caused by being on a few medications. Family history could also be relevant, especially in the mother. And uh, we know that polycystic ovarian syndrome more often can be just a clinical diagnosis. Going on to examination, general appearance and the ethnicity. A BMI calculation should be done with height and weight measurements, the belt, looking for central obesity or the apple-shaped figure, and obvious assertism should be looked for. A blood pressure measurement, again, moving on to the other adverse cardiovascular um, risks that are uh, present. So blood pressure measurement should always be done. Also looking for other cells like thyroid, um, um, high pro uh, prolactin conditions, and um, pituitary tumors, which could be uh, causing symptom, eye symptoms and stuff. Um, pelvic examination can, may or may not uh, give you much information. You may be able to feel Latinx cell masses. A uh, um, genital examination should also be done to rule out clitoromegaly. And if indicated, a mental state examination should be done. <coughs> and of course, when we, before we diagnose, we should be thinking about secondary causes as well. So mainly with the causes, uh, conditions that can cause uh, amenorrhea or hyperandrogenism. So amenorrhea can be caused by thyroid dysfunction, hyperprolactinemia, 
and uh, other uh, hyperandrogenic conditions like adult onset uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia or adrenal tumors or other or, or androgen secreting ovarian tumors. We've got to keep in the back of mind about premature ovarian failure, especially in the slightly older woman. A post pill amenorrhea could be presenting as an amenorrhea. And of course, pregnancy always needs to be ruled out when a woman presents with amenorrhea. Moving on to investigations, obviously the pregnancy is the easiest one that can be done in the clinic itself. An endocrine screening needs to be done. And if the woman is over 35 years, we should be adding on a lipid profile and a glucose tolerance test as well. After blood test, of course, an ultrasound scan um, and the necklace sign, looking, looking for the necklace sign or the uh, uh, peripheral antral follicles, increase ovarian volume, and also the ultrasound is helpful in excluding any of the tumors that might be there. Moving on to management, the most mainstay of management in uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, especially in the younger woman, is uh, lifestyle modification, aiming for weight loss, which consists of diet and exercise. And as GPs, we'll be playing a huge role in that. We should be uh, able to consider a care plan, get uh, you know allied health if in, uh, uh, input if needed, and regular monitoring to keep that motivation going. Because they may start good, but they may not be able to go through with it. And we find that in uh, polycystic ovarian disease, even small weight loss that is up to 5 to 10% of their body weight, it can be very beneficial in resuming menstrual cycles and ovulation. If the woman's, of course, presenting with fertility, like in my case, then a referral to a specialist is early, especially if the woman is advanced in years like over 35. Otherwise, we should be aiming for decreasing the weight loss, especially if BMI is over 35. At least trial that for six months before we refer on. And of course, she'll be needing some ovulation induction, possibly insulin uh, sensitizing agents as well. If the presentation is very complex, especially with hyperandrogenism, with the rapid onset of some, um, symptoms, we, and if the diagnosis is a bit difficult, we shouldn't shy away from referring to an endocrinologist for an initial worker, but can, of course, follow up after that. If fertility is not an issue, if it's just menstrual cycle regulation, then the um, combine, uh, combination of contraceptive pill or cyclic progesterone may, may be enough. Um, mental health, looking at mental health again, uh, see if, you know, counseling that as a GP what you can do and also if needed a psychologist help. And in the older woman, a cardiometabolic health needs to be looked at. Uh, obstetric sleep apnea should be screened for if indicated. And sometimes we might have to do cosmetic advice as well when the hirsutism is troubling them. Don't want to go too much into my long term at the moment. I'll move on to my case now. This was a lady who moved from um, North Queensland, and I've only seen her twice, but it was a very interesting case, so I thought I'll present it tonight. Mrs. VA, she's 33 years old, married for three years, working in a bank, and she's been trying to conceive for 18 months. She's never been pregnant before. Um, going on to her menstrual history, she attained menarche at the age of 13. From the very beginning, her periods were very irregular, coming every two to three months with slightly heavy flow, which can go on for 10 days. After a couple of years, at age 15, her mom took her to the GP and um, she was uh, put on the combined oral contraceptive pill to regulate her cycles. And having been a chubby girl always, she was advised to lose some weight. She tried the pill for even less than six months. She didn't like it. She, had, she was getting some mood swings and very bad nausea. Unfortunately, did not follow up with the GP. And once off the pill, her cycles became regular again. And the time gap between periods kept increasing. And there was a time when she was only getting about two to three periods in a year's time. Occasionally very heavy, but didn't go and see a doctor at all. She uh, commenced sexual activity at about age 17. And her first regular relationship was at age 26. By this time, she was also um, doing some extra studying to get a better job. She was getting very brisk, busy and stressed, gaining a lot of weight. Um, around the age of 28, periods got extremely heavy, and they were coming more frequently now. Her cycles were, could go on for a month or you know, 25 days, uh, coming every two to three months. It was considerably impinging on her sex life as well, and so she went and saw a GP at that stage. She had blood tests for the first time and an ultrasound scan and was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. The GP had discussed her going on the pill, but the patient preferred not to because she had such a bad experience with it when she was a teenager. And the GP then referred her on to the local gynecologist specialist, um, where she was counseled and um, she agreed to have a marina inserted. 
and it worked really well for her. She was only getting some mild infrequent spotting now and again. She was quite happy with how it was going. She married her partner at age 30, and things were getting a little more settled around, and after a year, they wanted to start a family. So she went and saw her GP. This was about 18 months back, and had the marina removed. She had also, after they were since the diagnosis for polycystic ovarian syndrome and uh, you know, weight loss being, importance of weight loss being uh, emphasized to her, she had been trying to lose weight. But by the time she hit age 30, she she hit her peak weight of about 140 kilos by then. After the marina was removed, the periods again came back. They were um, coming every three, you know, two to three months. Moderate flow, but she, it was never too heavy, so she, was, she avoided going on hormones as she was trying to conceive. And her last menstrual period was two months ago. Over the last two years, just before, she had actually managed to lose 12 kilos. Um, and she was working extremely hard, trying with her diet, working, you know, started a gym membership. And she, well, at the point when I saw her, she felt she couldn't do anything more. She was kind of fighting, you know, up against a black wall and not getting any further. Um, there was no other significant past medical or surgical history. She had only two pap smears. The last one was 18 months ago, which is fine. And there was no other past history of any, anything suggestive of an STI. She did have an STI check recently, which was negative. And there's no suggestion of pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, pointed history, I got, uh, there was nothing suggestive of an under or overactive thyroid. There was no galactoria. She did agree that she had to regularly remove hair from her face, arms, legs, and even midline abdomen. Um, she was not on any medications. Family history-wise, her mom had six children, had apparently had no trouble conceiving. Dad had a recent diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and hypertension and was on medication. She was an ex-smoker, having quit three years back, and very minimal um, alcohol intake. On examination, she was a very pleasant and well-dressed Caucasian lady, quite obese, with a typical central obesity. Her BMI came to about 45.4. Her blood pressure was raised at 141 over 101, and there was male type of facial hair evident. There was no goiter or galactoria. Abdominal, genital, and internal examination was limited because of habitus, but didn't reveal any abnormality. I did a urine pregnancy test, which was negative and discussed doing some bloods on her. She, was, she actually wanted to go ahead and get some bloods, recent bloods done, because the last one was about five years ago. Her uh, full blood count, uh, ELFTs, the thyroid and prolactin were all normal. Her cholesterol and fasting BSA were also normal. Her LH was 12, FSH was 8. Estradiol was 350 and progesterone less than 5. Her sex hormone binding globulin was markedly less at 9. The total testosterone was 3.9, and um, dehydroepiandosterone sulfate was 4.2. The second time, she also brought a picture of her old scan, which was five years, done a few years back. It was a typical polycystic um, ovarian picture. The uterus was normal with an endometrial thickness of four millimeters. Second time she came to me, she had also already been trying for 18 months. And she had tried and lost some weight on her own, and that she felt she couldn't go any further. And she definitely wanted to be referred to a fertility specialist because they were keen on starting a family. She had also had some private insurance um, organized, which is very frustrated at not being able to lose more weight. I went through the uh, discussion of a dietitian again. She had already seen one, wasn't keen to go on. I likely touched on appetite suppressants, but uh, blood pressure was also raised, and she was also not interested. She then surprised me by talking about bariatric surgery. And she had actually had a colleague who had had the gastric sleeve and had lost 40 kilos in six months, which was very attractive to her. And this colleague had also apparently conceived without any treatment. So she was very interested in that and wanted to talk more about it. And we did have a discussion about that. We discussed side effects, the costs that will be involved, and new to, uh, due to possible nutritional deficiencies, the need to wait further. She agreed that she couldn't afford it at the moment, but she was going to find out if she could access a super to uh, use to pay for it. Um, in the meanwhile, I did encourage her to keep going with the weight loss attempt, and I referred her to the fertility specialist, and she's awaiting review there. I mainly wanted to ask two questions to our panel today. Now, did I do the right thing? <laughs> This is a lady with a BMI of 45, and I have, uh, well, she has been trying to lose weight, and uh, she had had some success. Unfortunately, hadn't resumed uh, her cycles. And uh, we know that pregnancy is ridden with complications in women of that BMI. 
Um, so should I have done anything else, or did I do the right thing in referee horn straight away? You should have done. I think, having said that, you're absolutely right. I think uh, the, the delay be <coughs> the, between seeing you and, and seeing me is often the biggest concern, particularly here. And she's over 30 already, mm. and fertility drops off after 25, not mm. 35. And my experience is that it is almost unknown to see people losing weight the way you would like them to. Mm. And even if they go and have a gastric sleeve done, that's really not the po that's not the issue. Mm. They've still got the underlying metabolic disorder. That's right. And they really should that should have been addressed way before she even saw you. Mm. Um, and we don't know what pills she was put on mm. way back when, but she may well have been put on something <coughs> such as Levlon or Microgynin 30, which is one of the highest androgenic pills on the market, and it's still really commonly prescribed. And I think not being understood that it's, it's an androgenic pill and you're putting somebody with high androgens on more. And so there's really you know, the ideal pill would be one of the Yaz, Yasmin, Diane with the anti-androgens. She may have had that, and you can combine that with metformin when they're not trying to get pregnant, and then you can try to do the dietary stuff and see how you go. But the problem is, if we spend another two years trying to get her BMI Stop down to what fine. we think is OK, she's missing every opportunity at getting pregnant. And as you well know, there are people out there who weigh 140 kilos who get pregnant just thinking about sex, and others who don't. And there's got to be more to it, and um, I think we all know there's more to it, and there'll be things one day we'll be able to measure to say, you're one of those people who's going to have trouble and, and you're not. We don't have that just yet. Now, you did the right thing, but I think the, the only uh, investigation there that I didn't see was the uh, anti-malarian hormone. Yes, I did not do that. Uh, which is the first test to do on any woman presenting with a fertility problem, and indeed, um, I chair a group of fertility doctors from Australia and New Zealand at a, a meeting we have once or twice a year in Sydney where we're looking at fertility awareness and one of the things we would love to do would be to get the word out to say we should be doing an AMH on every 25 year old who hasn't had a pregnancy and is not thinking about having a pregnancy in the near future because you'll, you'll pick up uh, people with polycystic ovaries or worse with ovarian uh, failure. Uh, I did find in my reading that there was a note that, uh, you know, high levels of AMH may be even replacing the polycystic ovaries in think, the criteria for diagnosis. I think you're diagnosis. absolutely right. I think the, the Rotterdam criteria you can probably ditch now. Mm. Um, the morphological appearance of an ovary now is very, very unreliable, no, known to be very unreliable, and an AMH is a far better test. Mm. And I think also being pedantic, um, we're referring to the polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, there is a such a thing, and that's when you've got a high BMI with all the other things that go with it, and that's because therefore you have risk of these things. But there are women out there who have a, BMI, uh, a normal BMI or even a low BMI yeah. who have polycystic ovaries. That's they do right. not have the syndrome. Yes. But when they Google it, that's all they'll read. Mm. Mm. And that, that's a very different thing. They're different animals and they behave differently. So I've seen so many women who've been diagnosed with polycystic ovaries who have a normal or even low AMH. We had someone the other day who's had this diagnosis for a decade and her AMH was eight. I mean, she's got impending ovarian failure. So she, they might look like that, but they're not acting like polycystic ovaries. Also in the investigations, I think uh, there's probably only one lab in Australia that can probably give you an accurate measure of total testosterone, and that's a research lab. It's very unreliable, and you're therefore better off doing the free androgen index. In this lady, it was coming to something like 44, yeah, the exactly. free androgen yeah. index. So it, it's a better test to do. I know we still order that, but mm. it's, a, it's a better test to do. Could we just cal calculate it and extrapolate it, or should it...? No, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, a good way of measuring BMI, if you haven't got a little thing with you, is take 100 off the height in centimetres, yes. and, you know, it's, you're, if, they're, if they're above where they should be, then it's pretty easy to work it out. But uh, yes, I think err on the side of early referral rather than late. Uh, I mean, nobody gets hurt doing that. And most of the patients actually like it.
Thank you very much for those yeah. questions. Did you have another question there, Aravu? I think you had a second yes, question. Yes, I was saying if that was the wrong thing, what else should I have done was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, yeah, but I, I think the, the word's getting out there now, and I think they're, they're, more and more now I'm getting referrals with the AMH done. <coughs> And, but it's important to be able to interpret it as well. And, mm. I mean, it's useful in so many ways. I mean, it, it, in the not so bad old days, uh, if we had somebody with major endometriosis, we would say, oh, you've got to get rid of all that endometriosis, even ovarian endometriomas, before you can try and get somebody pregnant. Well, what we know now is if you do that, you kill eggs like crazy. Um, mm. So if you're stripping it or burning it, whatever, and the, the AMH will go like that. These are, these are people who have polycystic ovaries, but you, you, you've got to treat ovaries very gently. Mm. Um, one of the, the, the treatments that sometimes is mentioned is ovarian drilling or ovarian Wedges, golf balling. Yeah. Well, I would put that down as my very, 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 very last thing uh, to do because you, you can damage the ovary and get adhesions and other things, but you've got to be very wary of what your AMH is before you start on that because it will go down and you may be better leaving them with an increased ovarian reserve because we can always do IVF with that and mm. they'll, they'll have more eggs. So um, just for um, registrars that are seeing patients that have come with um, um, infertility perhaps um, and um, you wanted to order um, an AMH, what can you tell the patient? Because I understand, is, is it Medicare funded? It's not Medicare funded, uh, isn't it? $65, I think. $65? Uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. okay. That might going up, might yep. go up with yep. co-payments and whatever, but it's, yep. it's, just, it's, it's basically you, you have to sell it as saying this is a must-do test. Mm. So you mentioned that it's quite an accurate test and so just um, for the registrars out there and for my own learning, mm. um, so um, so when the levels is high then the reserve is good? Is that the yes. suggestion? Yeah, the range yep. of normal is 15 to 30 mm -hmm. uh, and above 30 basically that means polycystic ovaries, okay. mm. almost certainly. John, I, when I was reading about AMH mm. the other day, because I, as a GP, haven't routinely used that test, I've mm. just seen that those results coming back from you. Mm. Um, is, ha, does it have to be done at a certain time in the cycle? For no, and you can do it when they're on the pill. Um, oh, that was my if, other question. If, if there is a, a, a change in the, in the result, it would be at worst 30% low, but it probably isn't. Uh, there was a bad stretch uh, about up for 12 months until about 12 months ago when there was an assay problem mm -hmm. and there were a few people who were underdiagnosed, overdiagnosed. That's all been sorted, we would hope. But, I mean, it's, it, it's out there and uh, we've mm. got to currently have a 21-year-old who had an AMH of 1 mm. and she's now having... Um, uh, egg collections, we're freezing eggs, but we're only getting one or two at a time. Mm. And this is really indicative of the fact that that test is absolutely right and she's going to have a premature menopause. Mm. Um, it's a good test. So John, should we be offering that test to the women that we see in practice that I see who are in that 30 year old age group? 30, definitely. Definitely. I'm wondering what their fertility is and how yeah. long they could wait to yeah. have a pregnancy. Absolutely. I mean, 25. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. So if I can ask um, you, Ros, just to talk a bit more generally about <coughs> infertility and when patients do present in general practice um, concerned about um, their inability to fall pregnant, sort of what's your approach as a rural general practitioner? Well, my approach mm. is to find out how long they've been trying to fall pregnant for mm. um, and uh, as, as I think we've talked about before, either six months um, of unprotected intercourse over, um, sorry, six months of unprotected intercourse or 12 months if it's a younger person. Mm. But again, I agree that if someone's concerned, then at whatever age, you should probably do some investigations. The first, of th the first thing I always do is get a really good history uh, you know, a menstrual history, a, a, any previous pregnancies, any previous surgery, what medications, what the state of health is like. Um, then I no, always do an examination and a smear if it's needed. I often do a swab to check for chlamydia because that's mm. such a, a common thing. 
Um, I just do the, all the other routine blood tests, but of course I'm going to be adding another one mm -hmm. now. And uh, then I uh, send them for a scan. Mm -hmm. um, at that stage, I also ask them to bring their partner in mm -hmm. because they often present just by themselves. Yes. And I don't believe we should go any further with our investigations until we've taken a good history from the partner, examined them, and got a sperm test as well. Okay. And then, depending on all of those, mm. I then decide what advice and who I should, if necessary, refer the patient to. Excellent. And um, we were to sort of talking earlier about um, referral, and you're sort of um, quite keen sort of for early referral, particularly if um, perhaps there's indications that fertility is, is going to be impaired by um, a condition or, or perhaps by age or, or poor reserve. Um, so what kind of things are you looking for in a referral from a registrar that might be seeing a patient or a couple um, who are infertile? Well, I think the examination and the ultrasound and mm. I think all those bloods we've referred to, mm -hmm. uh, they could just be done as a panel. Uh, the, the more specialised tests such as chromosomes, which we, mm. we will do on every couple uh, who are referred, uh, will cost, if you go to one of the normal labs, about 400 each, mm. whereas we do them in-house for, for bulk build them because we do so many, so we've got a huge mm. cytogenetics department. But the AMH, I think if you can do that before they come, that's, that's, uh, that's very yeah. handy. Mm. If you're going to order a semen analysis, and that's not a bad thing to do, always ask for antibodies as well mm -hmm. because antibodies uh, if present uh, can cause all sorts of dramas they coat the head of a sperm so sperm can't penetrate an egg uh, you may notice motility issues but you may not and it can be an absolute disaster if you proceed with something like IVF for instance you may get failed fertilization but you know, we would never do an IVF cycle without knowing about antibodies but you may waste somebody's time and money trying to get them pregnant at home mm -hmm. if they've got antibodies. Um, as far as tu test of tubal pate to concern, well, again, there's nothing wrong with organising that as well. Um, and a hysterosalpingogram or a hycosy, perfectly reasonable to do. But one in 40 couples will have a chromosome problem who, mm -hmm. who present with infertility. It's a lot higher than you think. Yeah, that is surprisingly um, high. And again, mm -hmm. part of our routine testing is with a couple, we will always offer uh, CF screening. Mm -hmm and we always screen the male because the incidence of CF um, carriage is one in 25 in females, <coughs> one in 15 in males. And if these um, chromosomal abnormalities are found, is there counselling through your clinic um, mm. yeah, that's offered with regard to sort of... Well, most of that's done uh, where we are and there's not much uh, reason to take it further, but there are some fairly complex chromosomal issues that probably require a hell of a lot more work mm -hmm. and we have uh, as part of our, our, our group a, a clinical geneticist um, so we can refer them in house to, to that person and we, they're seen quickly. Mm. Could I ask um, Lisa if you could um, just elaborate for um, our audience today um, about um, if a patient is referred to your group's clinic, um, what the process is that that couple experience going through? Yes, and it, it does depend on what they're referred for, obviously. But they'll see Dr Esler first, they'll have their tests <coughs> taken, um, they'll be asked to come back to have their tests reviewed so that mm -hmm. Dr Esler can go through all those with them um, and recommend the best form of treatment for them. Um, if it does involve IVF or mm -hmm. um, uh, artificial insemination or any of those um, treatments that are uh, more complicated, I guess the word mm -hmm. is, um, they will be referred to one of the nurses and there's three of us that work um, at Queensland Fertility Group Toowoomba with John. Mm -hmm. um, and they are required to have what we call a nurse interview. And at that appointment, we again go over all the tests that Dr Ez has already explained to them. We explain the treatment that he has recommended for them. Mm -hmm. um, so that appointment can take about an hour and a half with the nurses. Right. Um, and <coughs> when they leave, they should have a full picture of where they're heading, they've had their questions answered, um, they know what to do if they choose to start treatment. They don't have to start treatment and we don't ring them and um, ask them why they haven't, um, but they're, more, they're encouraged to ring us with any other questions because questions come up uh, once they've left us, of, of, obviously, um, and often. So we have a lot of phone contact with them. 
Okay, yeah. Um, I think um, something I've come across, and I'm sure um, some other um, GPs have come across, um, is um, concerns about cost um, for a lot of people. Um, so, I mean, um, what kind of sort of cost can... I don't know, it's a difficult question because it does depend on, obviously, what treatment is recommended. Does, yeah. But, um, you know, and, and how do you help patients sort of navigate through that? Yeah. Um, With that interview, we do explain all the costs as well. Mm -hmm. they they, they're very well informed, um, they're given uh, quotes, they have exact quotes that they receive that they can take to Medicare, take to their private health insurance, um, so they'll know how much they're going to be out of pocket for mm -hmm. their particular procedure. So they um, uh, have that well in advance before they actually ever start treatment. Okay. If a couple have got top insurance, the best you can have, mm -hmm. and if they're up to here with the safety net, it's somewhere between two and three and a half thousand dollars out of pocket for an IVF cycle. Mm -hmm. It can be between six and ten, depending on what they're not covered for. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most people assume ten, but that's wrong. And these costs, in fact, are nothing to do with us, really. These are things that have come in because of other people's involvement in our lives. Um, government and regulation. Oh, okay. uh, we're probably the most heavily surveilled part of medicine in that we have to undergo a yearly accreditation process yes. uh, from a mob called the Reproductive Technologies Accreditation Committee. Right. That and sounds like an onerous process. That's before, that's before, <laughs> we, start, before we start work. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, 1st of January every year, so mm. that doesn't really happen anywhere else yet. Mm. John, are you noticing any difference in the type of fertility problems that you're seeing now than you did, say, 20 years ago when you first... Oh, well. Look, the answer is I think the pattern's still pretty much the same, except that we're identifying things a bit better. For instance, the AMH has uh, explained to us why we have this group of apparently healthy women whose ovaries responded so poorly and it took us ages to get on top of it. We're onto it now. So if someone's got a low AMH and we're doing IVF, we'll come in with a higher dose of medications right from the word go. 60% uh, of, uh, of our couples, there will be a significant male factor. And the technique called ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is probably the biggest advance in fertility treatment ever, uh, where somebody can pick up one sperm and inject it into one egg, uh, and we'll give you the same fertilisation rates as you do with perfect sperm, uh, was introduced in 1996. Prior to 1996, that was either have a go at IVF and probably wouldn't work. In fact, there was a technique back then called GIFT, a gamete intrafallopian transfer, where people picked up uh, a fallopian tube and put, we collected the eggs per vagina and then uh, mixed the sperm and the eggs together and put it into the tube so fertilisation would occur in the tube and for some time pregnancy rates of that were better uh, than with IVF because the laboratory techniques made as good but the laboratory techniques became better and it was quite clear if you had poor sperm that technique didn't work very well. Yeah. Um, there were also other issues, there was a Catholic gift and Protestant gift, whereas with Protestant gift you could mix the sperm and the eggs together and just squirt it into the tube but with a Catholic gift you had to have an air bubble between the eggs and the sperm so they couldn't get together before they got into the body. So there were those technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> so GIFT is basically never done. Uh, the pregnancy rates with uh, IVF, and including ICSI, have done that and they're still going up. And we now have different... We have knowledge of, of, of what happens to embryos. We, we've done, for instance, more embryo testing in Toowoomba than the rest of Queensland combined now and we can now get a full chromosome analysis of an embryo from either one cell or a number of cells, depending on when we biopsy an embryo. And we did our initial biopsying on day three because that's when we could do it, um, and then we had to grow the embryos to day five. The majority of those embryos were dead by day five, mm -hmm. even though they looked good on day three, and they're all chromosomally abnormal. So this is what nature does. I mean, 70% of all human eggs and embryos are chromosomally abnormal. And that's why, you know, if you're under the age of 37, you've got a 10% chance of pregnancy per month and a one in five chance of miscarriage. Mm. It's, it's pretty low. Um, can I ask a controversial question? Um, what is your thoughts on the use of something like Clomid in general practice? 
Um, well, I don't use climate anymore. Okay. Haven't for a long time, so yeah. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. uh, climate has been around for 35 years now. Mm. Uh, it's got a really good track record, uh, but it's, it doesn't work as well as it should. You'll get around an 80% ovulation rate, mm. but you won't get the, the same pregnancy or the pregnancy rate you should, and there's mm. a slightly higher, mis higher miscarriage rate than you should. And that's because it has an anti-estrogenic effect on everything in your body, including cervical mucus and including the endometrium. So I've been for about 10 years now using aromatase inhibitors, using letrozole. Mm -hmm. It does exactly the same thing, except it works within the ovary. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get that same mucus effect and you get a much better endometrium. Um, but getting back to your question, with whatever you use, <coughs> um, it's actually you need to be accredited, as you know. Um, you can't prescribe it without being uh, approved by the health department. You just have to be very careful um, mm -hmm. because uh, you can and do produce multiple follicles mm -hmm. and sometimes <coughs> multiple, multiple, multiple follicles. So <coughs> you have to be very careful and monitor these people closely. And if I were doing it in general practice, I would probably have a day 12 scan done okay. just yeah. to make sure of your follicle numbers before yes. they proceed. And you must do a day 21 or 22 progesterone to make sure it's, it's done the job or not, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're wasting their time and money, because if it's, you don't know whether it's worked unless they get pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a low uh, progesterone on day 21, 22, you, you'd up the dose in the next cycle. Mm -hmm. So, that, I mean, I think it's very doable, whether or not it's something that people would want to do, I'm not sure. I had some people in the other day who bought their Clomiphen online, mm -hmm. us, using it at home. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't sound very safe. I think there's some concerns, yeah, about, about sort of that, that kind of sort of safety issue um, there, and it's something that I think um, perhaps some GPs um, had been comfortable with using in the past. But um, yeah, well, I mean, I think if you're going to do it, you'd want, you'd want to be protecting yourself mm. uh, by making sure the documentation was pretty good, mm -hmm. so that you have warned the patient and they understand and they accept that there could be multiple pregnancy because it's. Mm. So if you get a high order multiple pregnancy, you could be in strife. Mm. Right, we have a, had a question come in on our Twitter feed, um, and it says, um, so this one um, is for you, Roz. Um, so what is the GP's role in suggesting adoption or surrogacy? Wow. <laughs> Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> in, in fact, these days, because um, adoption is so difficult for people mm. to achieve, we, I, I can't remember the last time I was actually asked that question. Mm. Um, surrogacy, again, I've never been asked about, and um, I would actually refer to someone else. Mm. Do you ever get questions about surrogacy and things? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, mm. This week, in fact. All oh, right. Um, look, Ros is right. Adoption is something that pretty much everyone knows is unbelievably difficult. Mm. And often they'll, they do it themselves, actually. They make applications and we'll just get the forms to fill out. Mm. Overseas adoptions become more difficult as well. But we're normally looking more at things like uh, egg donation, embryo donation, mm -hmm. And really, embryo donation is a bit like adoption, except you're taking it from an embryological phase. Mm. Surrogacy is legal everywhere in Australia now. Every okay. state have, has different laws. Uh, Queensland probably have the, uh, the loosest laws, one of a better description, but mm -hmm. it's there. Um, there's no IVF unit in the country who would uh, uh, ethically offer traditional surrogacy, which is basically using somebody's sperm to get the surrogate pregnant. Mm -hmm. It has to be an embryo. Mm -hmm. um, so the classic is the woman who's had a hysterectomy at a young age for whatever reason, mm -hmm. or who may have a medical reason that if she got pregnant she might die. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get to the other things like recurrent implantation failure where it's regarded to be a uterine problem and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, but the, but the counselling Yes. And the legal implications are just enormous. Uh, we have a surrogacy committee which, re which will look at every application and say yes or no. Mm -hmm. We'll refer them on to somebody else. Um, I can't, for instance, refuse to do surrogacy on, say, a gay couple and then mm -hmm. do it for somebody else. I've got to be seen to be consistent. So legally I could be found to be at fault if mm -hmm. I 
don't do it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Very complicated. Or send them on to somebody else. So um, the surrogates, are they usually a family member or known to the couple? Or are there people that put their hand up and say, I'd be a surrogate for anyone, like an organ donor? Within, within Queensland Fertility Group, um, yeah. they have to have been known to the couple for two years. Okay. So it's, so it's a long process. It's, it's not something, as, as John says, that they don't just decide on it. So, and it's not just saying, oh, I'd like to have a surrogate, I'm going to do that in the next 12 months. This is a person that has to have been known to it for two years. Mm. They can't just find someone. And it's an altruistic yes. um, arrangement. Um, the other important difference between what you read in the, the magazines of Australian law is that the surrogate owns the baby mm. until they de decide to hand it over to their commissioning parents, whereas in America mm. it's the exact opposite. Mm. The, mm. the commissioning parents own the baby and the surrogate can't keep the baby. Mm. So uh, have you ever experienced a situation where they didn't wish to return the, the baby to the uh, not commissioning parents? No, no. Not, in our, not in our unit, <laughs> no. no. Mm. Yeah. That must be something that causes a lot of um, anxiety and stress though, perhaps. During they are, the... um, they are counselled very much over those yes. issues, but yes. It's, it's, it would be a very difficult issue to face. For sure. mm, fantastic. Um, so if I can actually sort of throw things back a little bit further back towards PCOS and just coming back to sort of the whole of patient approach. I know that's kind of uh, extending the topic a little bit back, back to where we were. Um, but um, if I can ask you, Ros, just about um, managing these patients, um, particularly this is a case of a very obese lady, and if we can look at sort of the whole of patient approach. Um, yes, we've talked about sort of the fertility issues and, and getting onto those sort of early being very important. Um, but how would you address sort of the... Um, the obesity issue um, when you know she's saying I've tried everything you know I've, I've done all this exercise I've been you know I've seen a dietitian sort of how, how would you start to sort of unravel and um, and deal with those issues obviously mm. and take a, a more detailed history of mm. what the things that she has done I quite often I know it's a really old-fashioned thing to do but I actually quite often get them to write a diary mm -hmm. for a few days of what they're actually mm -hmm. eating because it's amazing what lack of knowledge people have even now mm -hmm. on on what to eat and what not to eat mm -hmm. um, in, in reality of course if they are exercising and they have tried everything else then I think referral to a surgeon with a view to discussing bariatric surgery is always useful. Mm -hmm. um, I always say to patients that they don't need to go ahead, that it's just giving them more information mm -hmm. and then obviously it is their decision. In someone who I would in fact start some um, diabetes, I uh, met foreman, mm -hmm. um, just to try and help the whole thing. Obviously I'd also investigate them for hyperinsulinemia and <coughs> you know all the other sort of blood tests. I'd always do that again just to see where they're at. Perhaps do a glucose tolerance test, check the blood pressure, you know, get that full medical history um, and appropriate investigations before I then suggested other things, but start back at the basics. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, if she were um, to be, say, um, on metformin, and I think we also use metformin sometimes <coughs> with um, people with infertility mm -hmm. to help with that, um, there was some concern in the past, I think, about the safety of metformin in pregnancy. That's um, not that's such a concern yeah. now, isn't I, it? I think it's pretty mm -hmm. much accepted. You can use it the whole way through okay, if you needed to. Um, can I ask Ross a question? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. In, in a previous life, uh, in general practice, Ros, a long time ago, uh, duramine was mm. commonly used and it's back. Mm. And I've used it a few times, but are you back using duramine again and do you find it useful? Um, yes, I am, if my arm is twisted mm. and if I am happy with the patient's cardiovascular system mm. and their blood pressure um, and if they come regularly for blood pressure checks and weight checks. Mm. Um, I certainly don't put anybody on it for a long term, but after all, it is the only medication we now have available to us to help with um, suppression of appetite. Mm. And in certain well-chosen cases, it can be quite beneficial. But you need time. Mm. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to quickly open things up to our studio audience. Um, any questions from our audience here tonight? So if we can start them as a GPs, like say if we have a big woman and um, proved polycystic ovary with two of the three criteria, um, if we start metformin, what is the dose? And if we start clomiphene, should we start with the 50 or with the, with the 100? Never with the 100. Never no, with the 100? No. Uh, 500 three times a day for the metformin. Mm -hmm. um, it's... Uh, ovulation rate is pretty low by itself, probably too low to use that by itself as, a, an, ovu as an ovulation induction uh, mm -hmm. helper. Uh, but you should always start on the lowest dose of clomiphene, that would be 50. Mm -hmm. uh, and you take it from day 2 to 6 of the cycle, not mm -hmm. from day 5 to 10. Mm -hmm. But I would counsel that if you're doing that in general practice, you really should be doing a, a follicle scan just to see how many there are. Because yeah. if there's any more than two, you would probably want to say don't have sex. Yeah. And then metformin? The metfor metformin, yeah. yeah how, met how much like we can start the dose? Or five. should we start, start it for all the polycystic No, 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 I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think the, if someone's got a normal BMI yep. and they've got polycystic ovaries and yep. you should know that from your AMH then, mm -hmm. uh, or a low BMI, mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't be using that as a first line. Sure. There is some data out there to suggest that there can still B, insulin resistance when they have a normal to low BMI, but it's not that common. Um, I would start using clomiphene first mm -hmm. by itself. Okay. And if you didn't get ovulation with that after, say, two cycles, then start your metformin. Sure. And the reason for that is that metformin has a very high side effect profile. Yeah. And um, you, if you don't need it, you don't need it. Mm -hmm. But it can be synergistic. There's no question of that. So with the, um, ro the role of the metformin with the polycystic um, ovary lady and that big obese lady, yeah. if she has normal oral GTT, does it have any role still to, to be used or I not? I think so. I mean, if, you, if you're trying to help them lose weight, is that what you mean? Or yes, or yeah, yeah. just yeah. Not, not for yeah. fertility uh, issues, just for uh, general. Yeah, I wouldn't throw it in on everybody with fertility, as I said before. I think yep. you'd start your clomiphene first, but if they're trying to lose weight, doesn't matter what age they are, if they've got a high BMI, I, I wouldn't really, I'd just look at it a clinical thing and say, let's be on metformin and the appropriate pill, and when you've lost weight, then you can come off the metformin and stay on the pill. Mm -hmm. Yep. Fantastic. But unfortunately, we are out of time. So thank you to Aravi for your excellent case presentation tonight, and can we all please work our specialist and expert panellists for their extremely valuable contribution to tonight's discussion.